And with this, I see the difference between a chief rabbi and a pulpit rabbi like myself. <laughs> Is that a chief rabbi comes once, and quite often to Australia once, yet his influence is so strong that people remember it for years upon years. A pulpit rabbi can say the same drasha every week, and they never, may not necessarily remember it. And so therefore, it's a great opportunity, I just let you know, Rab, Chief Rabbi, that I took my children out of school. You know, they should be able to be here for this visit, because I'm sure it is something that would be so remarkable that they remember it all the days of their life. And so with this, I'd like to call upon the Chief Rabbi, that he should address the congregation. Thank you so much, Rabbi White, for those lovely words of introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a huge pleasure for me to be here today. And the fact that uh, you've come specially on a working day, I appreciate it enormously. It's now my second day in Perth. I arrived late yesterday afternoon. My wife and I will be leaving tonight for Sydney and then to various other places. This is such a beautiful community and the best part of it are the people. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to having an opportunity to chat with you in a moment uh, over some refreshments. Yeshakar, Rabbi White, for the rabbinic leadership that you are showing here within this kehila and for the opportunities that are given to people to grow as individuals and within this lovely community. And a moment ago you mentioned the fact that sometimes a rabbi might give the same sermon or the same address. So uh, I'm reminded of the Maggid of Dubna, it is said of him, that uh, on one occasion he was approaching a certain shtetl, he had never been there before, and he was exceptionally tired. And his balagola, that's the wagon driver who would take him around from place to place, said to him, Rabbi, you are so exhausted. You know what? I can do you a favor. Instead of you giving the drosha, I'll give the drosha. He says, after all, it's the same drosha that you give in all places. <laughs> and by now, I know how to say it. So, Rabbi, when we come into the shul, you sit in the back row. I'll stand at the pulpit. After all, it was a before time when people had photographs and internet or anything like that, every man had a long beard. Who would know the difference? In a moment of weakness, the Dubna Maggid said, all right, I'm so exhausted. Okay, but don't tell anybody. They came into the shul. The wagon driver was greeted <coughs> with fanfare. People uh, stood up for him, greeted him, brought him up to the top. The real rebbe sat in the back row. The Rebbe was, uh, the Rebbe in inverted commas was introduced. He got up and did he give a drosha, the pilpul, the rambams, the shulchan aruch, the gemaras, the psukim. Oh, it was amazing. He knew it verbatim. Even the nuances, the punchlines, the words. It was fantastic. And then it came to question time. <laughs> <laughs> and a fellow gets up and he says, now you know that gemara in ksuvah stuff, kuf yuf aleph, amud aleph. Don't you think that the Gemara in Eruvin, that you'd Gimel and would bet, contradicts it, and then he brings the Rambams, and other Rishonim, and Achroinim, and this and that. And then uh, the Balagola says, that question of yours, it's such a simple question. Even my wagon driver will know the answer. Let's ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, what well, I'm going to say to you now, I didn't say last night, I didn't say this morning, um, 
I just want to share some thoughts from the heart with you. And you know, Chazal in the Gemara say, Tvarim Hayim. Yoytzim Menalev, Nichnasim Lalev. Words which come from the heart, enter into the heart. And I just want to concentrate on one word. It's the word Toldot. It's the name of this week's Sadra. And you know, words mean a lot. How do we understand the term generations? Why is this particular Sadra called by the name Toldot? And the way we utilize words provides a key to the type of people we are. So because uh, the rabbi mentioned that quite a lot of us here have a South African background, we know as South Africans that there, are, there is a certain way in which we use words which other people don't. For example, the word shame. <laughs> you know, in the rest of the world, when people use the word shame, it means a disgrace. <coughs> when a South African says shame, ah, oh, pity, Rahmanas, ah, oh, this lovely child, shame. <laughs> you know, it's a special South African way of saying it. Or the way South Africans use the word man. The word man can come into any sentence at any time. Ah, oh, man, it was so good. Really, man. Well, what's man got to do with anything? <laughs> we just throw man into it. Or sometimes we use a negative in order to mean a positive, such as the word no. You'll say to a South African, is everything all right? And the answer is, no, everything's fantastic. <laughs> no means yes. So when we're using terminology, it's important to understand it. So let's take the word toldot. The Sertra starts, the Ele toldot Yitzchak ben Abraham. These are the generations of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Why isn't this Sertra called Yitzchak? You know, there are six Sertras which have the names of people, including the Sertras of Korach and Balak. Not great people at all. But they have the honor of having a Sedra named after them. Therefore, surely Yitzchak, one of our great fathers, should have a Sedra named after him. And if the word Toldot is used as a name for a Sedra, there's a previous one. The second Sedra of the whole Torah, Noach, starts with the words, Ele Toldot Noach. These are the generations of Noah. If Toldot is good enough, to be a Sedra, Noach should have been called Toldot, but instead it's the Sedra of Noach. We always use the first key word, so in that Sedra, Toldot should have been the key word. So I'll tell you what I think <coughs> the answer is. Let's have a look at Isaac, Yitzchak. It is possible that you could view him as being a bit of a Nebuch. He always needed to be protected. When Ishmael, his half-brother, was taunting him and making life a misery for him, Isaac needed to be protected. Hagar and Ishmael needed to be banished from the home. Shame, poor Isaac, never. And then when it came to a question of a shidduch, Jacob, his son, was able to meet a lady, Rachel, at the great, at, not the great side, at the well side, and uh, it was all initiated by him, didn't need any introduction, but Yitzchak, he needed a shatkan. He needed Eliezer to go out to Haran, to Mesopotamia, to arrange a match for him. Yitzchak couldn't do things for himself. And even when it came to giving the blessing through which he would appoint the next father of the Jewish people, his wife, Rivka, she was really <coughs> in charge of the house. She was able to deceive him, able to fool him as to which son it was who would enter and get the blessing and so on. On the other hand, I actually believe that of the three patriarchs, Yitzchak actually for us must be the prime role model, and I'll tell you why. He is the symbol of stability and continuity. Abraham and Jacob lived part of their lives in the diaspora. Isaac was born in the land of Israel. He died in the land of Israel. God commands him in this week's Sedra, Shkhan Ba'aretz, dwell in that land. Don't step foot out of it. Continuity, always the land of Israel. Abraham and Jacob had more than one wife. Isaac had the one and only Rebekah, one spouse throughout his life. 
Avram's name was changed to Avraham. Yaakov's name was changed to Yisrael. Isaac was born Yitzchak, he died Yitzchak, one and only name, stable, continuous. And even his name suggests something very powerful. He was called Yitzchak after the laughter which had been, so he should have been Tzachak or Tzachaka. But called him, instead he's called Yitzchak, which means he will laugh, indicating that because he's that symbol of con continuity, there will be laughter, there will be happiness and joy in the future. What was the greatness of Yitzchak? Some people could say he was a bit of a nebuch. He was the son of his father and the father of his son. You know, some people go around this world all the time being known as their parents' child. After a while, they could be known as the parents of their child. Isn't it important to be known as yourself? Yitzchak was never known as himself. He was known as Avram's son and Yaakov's father. But I actually believe that that was his greatness. Because in the Jewish world today, there are some Avrams and there are some Yaakovs who sparkle and who are remarkable. But in truth, what do we as Jewish parents and grandparents want from our children and our grandchildren? We want them to be Yitzchaks. We want them to take that baton of Jewish tradition from the previous generations and to hand it on to future generations being children and grandchildren of Jewish people, and being parents and grandparents of Jewish people. We want our children to be Yitzchaks, to be stable in their Yiddishkeit, and to guarantee the continuity of our faith in the midst of very trying and challenging times. And that is why our Sedra, I believe, is called Toldot, Generations. Because it's thanks to Yitzchak and the symbol that he presents for us that we have continuous Jewish generations. As far as Noah was concerned, you might think, wow, that's certainly a man who should be known for generations for Toldot. After all, he became the new Adam, the new father of all of mankind and civilization. But no, Noah wasn't a symbol of somebody who lived for others, who was able to take a tradition and to pass it on faithfully. Noah was that man who, when he emerged from the ark, after the flood was over, what was the first thing that he did? He planted a vineyard, he drank the wine, and he became drunk. Totally irresponsible. Isaac was a steady fellow, guaranteeing that the baton would be passed on with tradition and in a faithful and responsible way. It is such a great pleasure for me to come here to Perth and to see a community of Isaacs. To see a community which preserves Jewish tradition, which takes the strength of if we're South Africans of our Lithuanian background, our deep-rooted commitment to Jewish values, and to see how it is being preserved together with other people here, regardless of where they've come from in the world. And I actually did meet a few who were born in Perth today, which was quite remarkable. <laughs> and, uh, and to see how this is a community which takes pride in its Yiddishkeit, and which wants to preserve Jewish faith and Jewish tradition through to the future. I want to congratulate you here in this show. I want to congratulate you in general. I've seen the beautiful schools that you have, the Morris at home, all types of facilities, a great kollel that you have. It's a wonderful community. It's my very first visit here. And please God, I will come on subsequent visits. Looking forward now to actually meeting you and uh, to saying Shalom Aleichem to one and all. Thank you so much for taking time to come and say hello today. Thank you, Rabbi, for your great leadership. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much to all of you for being the Isaacs of the Jewish community of Perth, guaranteeing that our Yiddishkeit, please God, will live on Am Yisrael Chai with strength for the future. And please God, you should only be blessed with good health and happiness and a strong Jewish life. Thank you very much. Once again, we'd like to thank the Chief Rabbi and invite everyone to afternoon tea which is being served in the foyer and everyone will have the opportunity to uh, speak to the Chief Rabbi. Thank you all for coming.